Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Lubkeman. I am the head of the Strategic Foresight Hub here at the ETH in Zurich. I have the great pleasure and privilege to be hosting a dialogue today with Professor Tang. Professor Tang is within the Department of Computer Science and has a group focused on computer vision and learning. And this is a dialogue within the collaboration between the AI Center and the Strategic Foresight Hub. The AI Center at the ETH is a center focused on AI and many, many different aspects ranging from ethics and legal tech and mobility and energy and running just about everything you can imagine is happening within the center and it's really quite a pleasure to be working together with them on this. This is part of a series which we are doing. This is the fourth one. And each each iteration of the series includes three aspects. The first is a spotlight, which is a, a talk in which Professor Tang explained Mary, like her work. And it's a very wonderfully produced piece that you can see on the AI Center's website. The second was a lab. In the lab we held last week, which was um, an interactive web-based discussion in which we talked about a deep dive into the theme of AI and retail. And then the third part of the series is always a dialogue in which Su Tang and I are going to get a little bit deeper into what her research is, why she's doing it, what it means, and where it's going. All of you who are here on with us today right now live and put questions Professor Tang, and you can do that through the Q&A and on the Zoom. Just go ahead and put in there and I will make sure we integrate those into our dialogue. So I encourage you at any time to put a, a question in there and I will field them. And if we don't get to all of them, I apologize, but so far we're pretty good at getting to all of them. So with that, I'm going to come over to Professor Tang. So you Tang, welcome. Thank it's, you. Thank it's you, wonderful to see you. A, a few sort of upfront questions. How long have you been at the ETH? Uh, so I came. I joined. I joined ETH uh, uh, January 2020. January 2020. So you are truly freshly here, and you joined right in the middle of COVID. Actually, I joined a few weeks before the lockdown. <laughs> Whoa! Gosh, well. We look forward to you being able to experience Switzerland in its full glory <laughs> and not in its lockdown glory. So, but it's great to have you here. And your focus and name of your group that you have is Computer Vision and Learning. Tell us a little bit more about what your group does before we dive deep into exactly what you're doing. Yeah, sure. So uh, my group, yeah, as Chris uh, mentioned, it's called Computer Vision and Learning Group. So we focus on computer vision research and we also develop machine learning algorithms for computer vision problems. And uh, for my group, we are mostly focus on human related topics. So there are two themes. So the first theme is on like human understanding. So we want to understand human shape, human pose, uh, human motion and activities from digital images and videos. So this is the first theme. And the second theme is about building uh, virtual humans. So we want to synthesize realistic virtual humans behave re realistically in 3D environment. So it's like synthesis part. So these are the two main focus of my group. That's cool. So I think it's fair to say one's interpretation, the other's generation. Yes. yes. So the interpretation, so how do you, so you say from images, or do you, do you do, do, like if you're going to do a, a digital, Chris, mm -hmm. hopefully not, but would <laughs> I have to come to your lab and stand there and and like pose as a model, or how, how do you actually do this? Yeah, so uh, for like creating virtual humans, so our goal is to um, democratize a human like a human creation process. So in the sense, we are really aiming for a, a, for a pipeline or for a framework, uh, which like people come to our lab, 
we have uh, just a monocular Kinect, like a monocular camera, and then they do some like pose in front of this Kinect. And our goal is to create a virtual avatar of this, uh, this person. So yeah, you have to come and then we capture you and then we hopefully we can create a virtual have avatar. And so, and so but what, what do we do? What do you do with the avatar? Or what do the avatars do then? I mean, so, so we have a little digital Chris and what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it belongs to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe in the future, we have a platform where we can have this uh, virtual conference, right? And then everyone is not seeing like a picture or a video 2D. Uh, of course, we can maybe interact and discuss in a virtual world with our virtual uh, avatars. Hmm. <laughs> That's interesting. And so in order for me to interact with that, do I need, is, do I need goggles or is, do I just look at the screen or? How do I? So um, this is really like uh, the goal, right? It's not, so we were like, for example, for the like, uh, yeah, virtual conference, like Zoom meetings, right? And then maybe in the future, what we need is uh, like VR glasses, right? So everyone has a VR glasses and then we are in the virtual room, right? And everyone has their own avatars. And then we can like, we can communicate, feels like in-person meeting, but in a virtual world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then if this virtual avatar uh, looks and behaves realistic, and I think this uh, uh, the the experience of this meeting will become like better and better. If it's so, could you imagine that could be quite interesting for the, those? Like, if I think of Cyblathon at EDH, we have Cyblathon, which is a activity focused on those who are disabled in some way, physical physical disability, as we call that. That um, you could use your you could use this physical avatar to help us understand how these individuals could move through a, a, a room or a new design, an architectural design, or not. Or, or what are some of the use cases you could see for these avatars? Yeah. So one use use case. Uh, so for virtual avatar, yes. So one 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 case is we are collaborating with the uh, architecture department. So they are like building like future like uh, uh, architect archi mm -hmm. architectures right buildings, mm -hmm. and then the 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 uh, the uh, uh, the thing we provide is actually a generative model, so a way to automatically populate their like uh, like uh, 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 designed uh, digital buildings, yeah. so that the architect have a feeling like how this space be used by humans so that the design is like becomes more uh, effective and environmental friendly because now like this iteration is much faster right it's all happened in the digital world yeah. right and so are you able to also program behaviors into your into your people yeah. yes so this is a, a big part of the the whole like avatar creation right so we, we are not just interested in creating like avatars which looks like you <laughs> mm -hmm. we are also interested in like uh like uh creating the avatars that like behave move first move right the second is behave like real humans mm -hmm. right i have my way of talking my gestures and hopefully we can do that too and the way we are achieving that is by two steps the first step we want to be able to capture human motion human behaviors right and it's not an easy task actually to capture Right, right. So when people try to do it in like motion capture lab, but it's very constrained scenario. Hmm. So we want to capture people natural behaviors in their like daily life, right, which hmm. means we really need a, like a lightweight setting. So then what we are doing now is, for example, to capture natural human motions, human interactions in our like daily environment in office in rooms with just a monocular camera there. So I have a key hmm. there it can capture. And now we can do this capture. And then the next question is if we capture data of myself, for example, for a long time, like, and then with this data, can we, can we create a model which can synthesize the behaviors like that looks like me, the motions like look like my own motion. Hmm. So. So are those two different aspects? I'm just, I'm trying. There's one aspect, the, as you said, is the interpretation, and the mm -hmm. other aspect is the generation. So yeah. the, the skin, if you will, and the actual physical attributes is one part of the research, and then get, getting it to behave and to move and to, you know, to, 
getting it to be able to do this by itself is another aspect. So you have different groups doing different things like that. Is that correct? So, did, um, my, did my, yeah. So I, there was an internet republic. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so I tried sure. to, yeah. So yes, there are two different aspects. So like to make, to make the avatar move like real, real humans, right? We really need the data about these real humans, like mm -hmm. how this human behave, right? And then to think about it, how to get this data is already a hard problem, right? So like when, assuming we have such data and then with large amount of data with like uh, advanced learning mechanism, then we can maybe learn a model of how this like avatar moves so that look like. And so how much of that can you extrapolate versus direct observation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's a very good question. So extrapolation is a <laughs> is a big topic in machine learning, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. deep models always involve. I'm not sure about 100, but it's always like have some kind of overfitting things into the training set, right? And then uh, extrapolation is like is is really a challenge thing, right? Especially when we think about post extrapolation, right, and this kind of behavior extrapolation. And then the current strategy we have is to use some advanced learning mechanism like called meta learning, like few short learning, zero short learning in the sense like I already have a meta learning, I have already have a model which covers lots of different people's different behaviors, right? And now if I see like the motions of this person, but just a short, like short period, like a mm. short, a small amount of data of this mm. person, can we do like a uh, uh, future learning to adapt the big model to this person so that this model can be used for this person and to go beyond just the capture data. So that's, that's a very interesting, exciting research topic. Hmm. That's really cool because we think about that, the difference between human vision and computer vision, because humans are... I think we, we lost, <laughs> Chris. Right, right. So did we lose it again? So I was just saying mm -hmm. this, the difference is a big difference between human vision and computer vision. Mm -hmm. And humans are very, very, very good at filtering mm -hmm. lots of information, which one mm -hmm. part of our brain determined is is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It's registered but irrelevant. Mm -hmm. that, what? So, can, are we able to do that with computers? Is this, is this also part of what you're trying to do with your work with can the com research, or is this someone else? Or where do we stand with that? Um, so I'm not 100% sure about uh, that part. So what I can tell is like, for example, for a human to understand another human from images, from videos, mm -hmm. right? What we can see now is still much, much more than a computer can understand. So I can really read, for example, facial expressions. I can guess intentions. I can I can understand whether this person is paying attention to my talk or this person is not paying attention, or if he's interested or if he is like not interested. Right? This this type of things as humans, we we somehow can really get these social signals from what we see. But those those things are still super super hard for computer vision algorithm to to figure out. So nowadays, what computer vision algorithm can do is to maybe like pose estimation, motion estimation, like like landmark estimation, but it's I, I feel it's still on the recognition side. The mm -hmm. story, the intentions, attention behind all this like like uh, pose, like all this this type of signal is still not uh, and is understandable by the computer. Yeah, I guess as you were saying, it's a human can understand what another human is. Computer is is my am I, am I zooming in and out? I I'm not sure it's my or you, but that, they, yeah, I think my every day this around this time it it happens. So let let's let's just let's just change the direction for a moment. Unless the title of today's engagement, if you will, is AI retail. Mm -hmm. Right, and so how is the work which you're doing relevant to retail? Uh, yeah, I I think 
there are really many, many, many links to retail, to retail okay. industry. So I can give you a, a few examples. Great. So the first uh, example is autonomous stores. Right. Uh -huh. So if you okay. see Amazon Go and this type of autonomous stores, what people are really trying to do is to to really let the let the like let let the like um to understand like what human uh, did in the store by by the sensor input instead of like uh, human there, right? And then what they normally use is computer vision, sensor fusion, and deep learning technique to really understand the human pose, human motion, and human behaviors in the in the store. And this actually aligns very well with uh, with what we did, like the first theme in my book, right? Human pose, human motion, human activity, understand yeah. to really understand those from digital images. So this is one connection I see, and then another connection mm -hmm. I see is for the generation side, right? So now we are aiming to synthesize realistic human behaviors. For example, how 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 i could grab a new object right like this new behaviors and how do i like uh, uh do i move in a, in an environment so i feel like this behavior synthesis like generation could also be useful for the autonomous store in the sense it provides it's a big component in the synthetic synthetic data generation so if if you go to check amazon right i think like also, Microsoft, like uh, like uh, Hololens, mm -hmm. they use a lot of synthetic data. So they have synthetic hands. They try to train computer vision algorithms with this synthetic data. And then, if you see their synthetic data building pipelines, to me, the 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 the, the point which are which are not ideal yet is the motion part. Mm -hmm. So they have a body model, hand models, and then they 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 have a like. They normally capture data and then to animate this body model so that they can render like realistic human behaviors in the store or grabbing the object and then they use computer vision algorithms. But they need to capture the data first mm. and it's a limited set, right? Mm. What if we have a, a generative model which can synthesize how human grabs a object, which a new object, right? A new item in the store. We can synthesize those things. And then this really will scale, scale up the synthetic data generation process, which I think is really important for training computer, uh, computer vision algorithms for autonomous stores. Yeah, so that's, I think we are. That's cool. So we're, we're okay. We're, you're, still, you're still here. You're with me. Are you here? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure about you. <laughs> No, oh, no, I'm here. So, as I'm hearing that, I'm thinking to myself, okay, so with the autonomous store, I have a little store in the middle of nowhere, which is difficult to supply, and it can track. How can, can you, can you tell if I'm going to steal something? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't, I, mean, I, I think people can do, I mean, I probably, at least from the advertisement of Amazon Go, it seems. <laughs> they can tell. They can. <laughs> yeah. Um, th th it's like, uh, I think from what we are doing, like this algorithm, like this type mm -hmm. of things until the real working system, right? There are also other things like sensor fusions. And mm -hmm. also like, there are many, many things to make the whole system works. Yeah. And probably like the successful rate of the, at least Amazon yeah. probably is not so bad. <laughs> I, I never really yeah, check their data. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this, another different question. So I mentioned before how computer vision, excuse me, human vision was so good, but there have to be situations where computer vision is better yeah. Yeah. than humans. Yeah. Where, what, what would those be? Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't have a complete list. <laughs> no, no, I don't. I just give you a few so, examples. That's all. Yes, I, I think. For example, the, the task like this fine fine grained uh, uh, category like uh, categorization classification. Uh -huh. For example, there is a data set like fine grained bird, like all different kind of bird, zero shot learning like to classify all this bird. I was I'm not able to do that. I mean I, I train myself to look at those and I've thought about it. Yep. And I think computer probably like computer vision algorithm probably have a higher uh, like uh, like uh, a uh, successful <laughs> rate than human. Mm -hmm. But back to your sorry, back to your previous question about sure. research and retailing, right? Another yep. thing I want to mention is uh, is like 
uh, like clothing. Mm-hmm. So uh, this is also something we are like we are looking into, right? So if you think about this, like a uh, smart mirror, this like new mm-hmm. virtual try on devices, right? A really important thing is to accurately estimate the human like minimal shape. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm standing in front of a mirror, right? And like, uh, and then how do I really accurately estimate like my uh, my minimal body shape so that the 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 the, the, the system can recom- recommend me a, like a, a right size, yeah. right? Yeah. So this is also very much related to our uh, research. So we have a project where we try to actually ongoing project still like where we try to estimate accurate human pose and shape from really past observations for example like rgbd uh, depth information this type of things so i think mm-hmm. that there is a, mm-hmm. a a very much direct connections yeah so so it becomes like if i'm buying something it says if you if you just bought those you probably like this because this will look really great on you yeah, those are the recommendation systems, I think. Yeah, right. yeah. So this is, but now we're talking about not just for books or not just for silverware or, mm-hmm. but now so for clothing. And this is if within yeah. the retail environment. You're saying I'll be able to stand in a booth. It will tell me the 10 things in the store that would look great on my body shape. Yeah, yeah, and the requirement for that is the, 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 like they need to know first, like an accurate estimation of your body shape, right? And all the synthesis in the sense, like if I upload uh, like a photo of me with some clothes, right? And then can this store can provide like synthesis images me on other clothes, right? I think that will really uh, change, uh, make a big change but, if that synthesis looks good. <laughs> But what if I don't like that it tells me I'm a size 38? I really think I only should be a size 36. I, what, what are you going to do about that one? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, that probably is out of my uh, expertise. <laughs> That's out of your research group, huh? <laughs> That's, That's we only tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like, um, I mean, yeah. I, I think it's really about the Actually, I think it's might related in the sense like if we have an accurate estimation, right? Whether we can like it's also about synthesis model, right? Whether mm-hmm. we can like because synthesis are close on a human body and a 2D, right? It's not easy yeah. to ask. If the synthesis looks realistic, looks good, probably it doesn't matter like what size a person is, like it looks good, it looks right. good. <laughs> I don't want it, I don't want it to make me look realistic. I want it to be, I want it to make me look good. That's your <laughs> There's a slight another different question for you, and this is the before before I give you this next question because I'm just really super curious about this. I just want to remind those who are online with us right now that you can pop some questions into the Q and A, and then I can integrate those into our conversation. So I, you know, I was I don't know, you don't know this maybe, but you know, in, in the built environment, I was head of research at a, a big engineering architecture engineering group for many, many years. And one of the things there we also saw happening was the utilization of imagery of buildings to try to make 3D models. You could go retrofit a 3D model of, of a building. Mm-hmm. And so, so, and this is when you were doing the interpretation part, there's a little bit of that, you know, we, they're interpreting it. How easy is it for you to, like, because we could get super accurate models down to centimeter, you know, even really incredibly accurate models. How ac- how easy is it to m- do the retrofit model of the human? Is it like is it is as easy as getting the facade of a building, or is it a lot harder? Um, in my view, it's a <laughs> it's a lot harder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's. I mean, buildings like it's it's also not easy, but it's rigid. Right, it's mm-hmm. a rigid things, right? Yeah. And human is really dynamic. It changes yeah. over time. It's it changes like we change our clothes, our hair goes longer, right? Yeah. Our body shape change even depends on what we eat in uh, for the breakfast, right? Yeah. So yeah. there are like lots of changes, and the human is highly articulated, and we we move like uh, yeah. So I I feel like for human, it's there are, like the changes, the dynamic part makes it much harder than like rigid object. So is there a very, is there a certain part 
of the human, like the elbow or the wrist or the 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 neck? Is there, is there a certain part of the the movement of a human which is more difficult to capture or to model than another? And so, from based on our current technique, the hand is a hard part. Mm. Yeah. So, like uh, we have a setup, like a setting uh, mm -hmm. where we try to capture accurate human scene interaction motion mm -hmm. in daily life. For example, in office or in uh, in living room, in kitchen, right? And then the, we only we, we try to only rely on a monocular connect in the sense we don't need the calibration, right? It's really easy setup, lightweight setup. And then what we found, like so far, uh, the really hard part is the hand. Hmm. So multiple reasons, right? Hand only occupy a small amount, really small amount of pixels in an image. So the information is not a lot to play with. <laughs> and hmm. also hand highly articulated, hmm. self-occlusion really moves really fast. So for us, hand is, uh, is a hard part. Hmm. Interesting. So for those who don't know what the uncanny valley is, can you explain what the uncanny valley is? <laughs> yeah, so my understanding, again, my understanding about uncanny valley <laughs> is, <laughs> so when we build like virtual humans, right? As you, let's use virtual human as an example. So mm -hmm. when we build virtual humans, right? So there is like, uh, there is uncanny valley in the sense, like you, you can be more and more realistic, look realistically looking at right, these virtual humans but people's like the, the the likeness like how people appreciate this model actually becomes really like goes goes to 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 a bottom in the sense like when this virtual human looks like a person but it's not doesn't really look very much like a person like people don't like it mm -hmm. so that's my understanding about uncanny, uncanny valley that's why like a lot of virtual characters are cartoon characters because then people know they are not really humans, right. they are cartoons and people like those. But right. for this like virtual humans, which look like humans, but not like, not really like humans, it's a bit scary. So it's sad. And, and the work you're doing with the capture and the generation, is, is your focus more on the, the accuracy of the representation of the human, or is it more on the movement and the, and the or is that the wrong question to ask? It's, um... <laughs> I can try to answer that, so I see. Uh, so for the capture part, understanding part, right? It's not really related to the Akali Valley thing because we try to get a semantic understanding of humans, right? A semantic information, mm -hmm. like understanding of humans from digital images. I mean, digital images, digital images is basically numbers, right? Like a pixel, so pixels are numbers. So we try yep. to make a sense of those numbers, right? Yep. We have a video. So those part is really about accuracy. So whether we are trying to reach, for example, if if as humans I can really tell where my hand is, and as to the computers when they see just numbers, right? Can they make sense of these images to really get where 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 my hand is? Hmm. So that part is really about accuracy. And mm -hmm. and uh, what kind of semantic information we can get from images, but for the synthesis part, uncanny valley play a really important uh, uh, important role, right? So our goal is to generate or create virtual avatars that look like real humans, but at the same time move and behave like real humans. So that is oh. the ultimate goal. And both for both for the appearance looking part and for the motion behavior part, I think both have this Akali Valley effect and both mm -hmm. are like those are really big challenge for us. So which is harder, the looking part or the moving part? <laughs> and this is a hard question. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I I don't know. I think both are really really challenging. Mm -hmm. But we we haven't solved both. I think both are extremely challenging. Yeah. 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 That's good. I I can't wait for to see the avatar of the Road Runner. You know, <laughs> so it looks realistic and not. Just... For, for for my group for our expertise, right? I we we find like appearance is more challenging. Oh really? That's interesting. Yes. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like with like the cameras. Um, you really, 
Or let's put it here another way, right? So because our goal is democratize like this generation. So we really want to get avatars from like single cameras, like really like Nemo set of captured like setup. So that's why we found appearance is really challenging. Mm -hmm. But in the like industrial setup, right? If you think about Hollywood or like movie industry, how they create avatars, they have a hundreds of calibrated cameras. Right. So for sure. them, then appearance, I think they have already very good tools to really build a uh, good appearance. So for them, yeah. maybe it's a different <laughs> thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so as you're doing the modeling of the human behavior, because there's many ways I'm sure you can do that. One is just a pure behavior. The other is the behavior within a context. Mm -hmm. Right. So are you looking at both of those and is, is one more difficult than the other? In behavior and contact. Yeah. So if you're like you were talking earlier a little bit about autonomous stores, mm -hmm. or with the architectural model of you know, putting people inside of that, mm -hmm. is this so the, the human inside of that environment also mm -hmm. interacts with the environment? Like mm -hmm. you have to walk over and turn on the switch, or you reach over to grab a new pair of shoes to try on, or or grabbing the bottle to drink mm -hmm. the water. Right. Those are also movements yes right and so are you work are, is your yes. is your research also on that too yes 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 definitely that's um i put a lot of effort and resources on that actually mm -hmm. to capture interactions so as i said, like the, the 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 setup we were trying like to capture motions is really about to capture how human interact with a daily environment uh -huh. so how do I how do I move inside the room, right? How do I go from my table to the sofa? How do I go to my table for to the whiteboard, right? And so this is really about the interaction and motion, mm -hmm. right? So motion and the interaction. And I think humans interact, we interact with the 3D world. For example, I'm sitting on the chair, you're also sitting on a chair, right? We're talking to a, like a, a screen. <laughs> so humans interact interact with the 3D world, with the 3D world around them all the time, right? And also human also interact with each other all the time. So our like motion and the behaviors is really like the focus is really to understand to capture and to synthesize the natural human interaction with the environment mm -hmm. and the human interaction with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So interaction so, is a part. So here here's so like well, I also moved to Switzerland in just about the same time you did, and I had to buy a bed and a chair and right. And bed sizes are different here than in, in California. Okay. Right? Because the 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 size. And I was just thinking as you were talking about that, I was wondering if I had the avatar, the, this digital Chris, I could actually get onto the bed and see if if it's if there was a digital online bed store. Digital Chris could climb up on the bed. I mean, could you could you imagine a scenario where that could be what what could happen? Oh, I think that would be super cool. So now I'm just uh, like brainstorming <laughs> the, the the play. So are we? I think we lose Chris again. No. No, no, I'm still here. <laughs> I was just being really still. <laughs> okay, I see. There you go. So, I'm thinking about, for example, IKEA, like, right? So now if I go to IKEA, I have to really imagine like how this furniture looks like in my room or how this furniture, like if I use it, like how, how it looks like, right? Yeah. And if I have a, like, I'm really imagining the future, <laughs> imagining right. the future. So if I have a augmented glasses, right? And I have a virtual avatar of me and I have a model to really animate this virtual avatar to interact with a, with a 3D world. And then I'm imagining, I'm imagining a, a app, which if I go to Ikea, there is a bag, maybe I turn on my uh, 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 augmented reality glasses and then my virtual avatar would uh, like lying on the bed to see like I would have a feeling like how, how, it, how this object would fit me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, and then I think that's the future. Have, it's interesting because then can you give the physical proper? Do you give physical properties like weight and m muscle capability? Can you give that also to your models? To your digital, so, to your digital, Chris. Yeah. So that's that's a very interesting uh, 
very, very interesting in this direction. So, so far we haven't really touched the physical simulation part. Mm -hmm. So we do everything like by, so it's not physically like a uh, based, physics based model at all, right? Mm -hmm. And now we are exploring that. So trying, so the, now the, the thing we're exploring is how to, so we, we are trying to read, for example, reconstruct human motions from a video, right? And then this reconstruction is purely based on pixels, based on the models, based on the learned models we, 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 we learn. And now we're trying to see whether we can have some physics inspired features or like properties in this reconstruction pipeline yeah. so that the reconstructed motions are more physically plausible. Right. And this is for the reconstruction theme or understanding theme. And then the, I, I could imagine the next step is for the synthesis theme, right? Maybe build like physically inspired models so that the synthesis, the behaviors and synthesis, the motions is more physically plausible. I think that's, I think that's a really interesting direction. Yes. Um, really interesting direction because I'm just thinking I come back to trying out the bed if that model had the if my if digital Chris had a certain weight let's say it's the actual weight my wish weight and then you could climb up onto those different mattresses and perhaps the mattresses could model the behavior and you could see how it would deform or yeah. something, or you could see what, what chair you could actually fit in yeah yeah oh, yeah interesting yeah, I think there is really like lots of interesting mm. questions one could explore. Yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. I think that's really that's really quite cool. So here's a, a different, a very different question. And so, as part of the learning aspect, mm -hmm. right, is making a future journey. Do you um? Do you, how do you imagine our digital version of ourselves interacting or being part of the university of, of the future or would we would we would we have at 16 you know you're getting you're given your digital self and that digital self goes with you into the military service and goes shopping with you and so chris uh, i think we I, I love the first part of the question because uh, the the internet <laughs> oh, okay. I was saying, like, I was thinking about the university of the future, uh -huh. like when we in the future of learning, mm -hmm. right? Um, what what could this could this play a, a role in enhancing our, our understanding of in some way? Or I, I'm just curious because this it's one of my one of our projects in my team is on the university of the future with ETH, of course. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious how that might uh, might play. If you have any ideas on that one. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, I mean, th th these are different. So, I personally, I still like to have a, like a physical, like face-to-face -face teaching, right? Mm -hmm. That's, 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 I like uh, better than like the online teaching, all right? So, but I, so that is for sure i would prefer to have like in person like uh, classes type of things but i think the tools we are going to use will be will be different would be different in the future so for example the way we visualize things mm -hmm. right now we visualize oh let's say in this way so the way we teach now is really for example if we want to visualize it it's on 2d it's a mm -hmm. slide it's on images right, right? Right. And that's that's also that's how we consume digital digital information images these, these days, right? It's always on two Ds. Yeah. And I, I think futures with AR and VR like technique develop development become better and better. I feel in the future we will consume those content in three D. Hmm. So, and I, I also think that that's will cool. <laughs> I also feel that will influence the way we teach, right? Mm -hmm. So it probably again Teaching, I would probably pr prefer in person, but it's like very like sure, subjective, sure. right? But the way we, we explain things, the way we explain the concept, it might go beyond 2D. It might go to, to, to 3D space, right? If we explain a functional derivative, like now we can really visualize it instead of like to project it to the 2D space. No, I think that's, I could see that because then the digital, your digital twin, your personal digital twin could go and experience a place and you could walk with it, right? For example, or 
me of something uh, you know, something like that where yeah. perhaps motion ca motion capture cameras could yeah. help you know so in the in the architecture department uh, there is a new lab called mm -hmm. uh, idl interactive design lab so they build actually this like uh, a lab to i mean i if my if based on my understanding it's also for the education purpose right the student will see like the design like more in 3d like in the augmented space not just in 2d so i think mm -hmm. the teaching and the education part like the vr ar to bring 3d back into the way we, we teach is already like people start to explore yeah that's good so here's another little question that's the following um, I see my internet is unstable, so I'll repeat it in just a second. Am I back? <laughs> Do you hear me again? Yes, you are back. <laughs> you, okay, okay, good. So I, a little sign comes up, your internet is unstable. Mm -hmm. So here's an interesting thought. If we actually have digital Chris being able to go shop online, mm -hmm. will I still, will, how will that, how do you believe that will impact then like the, the physical shopping experience because it could be more it could be a hell of a lot more exciting and it's a lot easier i could just sit there and i could watch myself go into the store and try on things or i go in once and i get size i never have to go back again i mean <laughs> that, that's that that is a hard question actually um uh for me i think it's more like a business model right like Mm -hmm. Just my, <laughs> my, 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 my guess or my imagination is probably like it will influence the, the like, uh, like the, the offline shopping, right? Go to the store, but maybe the, the, like the, like it can give us more personal experience, right? Like more mm -hmm. like, like maybe like it's, it's, it's kind of a, a place which, which not just for shopping, but also for communicate for communicating, right? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So are you, no, I, I hear that. So here's a very different angle. So are most of them make your students and very fit individuals, or are you also, are you also trying to capture and model the behavior of say elders or a 90 year old man or woman and model their movements, which is very different mm -hmm. than a, a, a teenager or a 20 year old. Yeah, so I, I would be interested in that because I believe like, uh, like for example, this like uh, elder care, right? So like this are an important topic and with computer vision, like with kind of machine learning, so we 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 probably can do something good for for this mm -hmm. for this application, but currently we don't have such a project. We don't have such data yet. So I, I think if I mean if there is a chance to collaborate with, for example, uh, like a hospital, like a university hospital, right, or mm -hmm. like to collaborate with some organization, and then. I, I would be more than happy to do that. And I believe like the thing we, the model we developed, the method, the algorithm we developed could also be used there. And then there are some special like application scenario for them. And then it's really designed, probably we have to redesign for those scenarios. All right, because I'm just, I was, I was just thinking, if we're thinking access and accessibility for an elder or someone who can't move as you, as you or I can move, and then perhaps then you're, your digital, the generated digital model could actually try something because it's actually, it's some, which is interesting to me is it's, you've taken this off of a real human, right? And you're able to model the way I, let's say 85 year old me moves. And maybe you could, you know, this is something could be quite fascinating, actually. I, I'm just, sorry, I'm just thinking about, because we don't know, right? Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to say what's accessible and what's not, and our rules are very difficult to, there's just a bunch of rules. And if you could use your model to actually have someone try it, or to go mm -hmm. into a store and say, hey, it's, it works. Don't mm -hmm. don't be afraid. Ah, uh -huh, I yeah. see, I see. Okay, now, I, yeah, yeah, it's like, uh, yes, a synthesis, a scenario, like uh, right. using digital, Digital twins using digital versions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
That's that's really cool. So if if what is the hardest of all the work you're doing right now? And you think, what's the hardest question you're trying to answer at the moment in your group? Mm, oh, there are so many hard questions. Oh, <laughs> uh, just just pick one or two, or just what are <laughs> what are some of the hardest questions you're trying to solve? Yeah. So one uh, one topic we have been working for more than working on for more than like two years is human motion synthesis. So that I find is a very, very hard task. So we like, especially like we want to synthesize human emotions in a like in a um, in a room, right? To have realistic behaviors, for example, whether the person can walk and go there and sit, right? So mm-hmm. I, there are multiple reasons I think it's still hard. So first, maybe we don't have enough data for that. And the second is we don't have a really a very good model yet for that hmm. so the existing machine learning tools are like i mean like there are existing machine learning tools and networks hmm. but we found those are uh, those are not good enough hmm. so it have accumulative errors it is difficult to train it doesn't really generate super super realistic human motions like no foot skating like it's i find it's a very hard problem hmm. both from the learning set and from the data set that's interesting because that would be also in a retail environment is how you can move to and through the store. Yeah. Like navigating in between the racks and yeah. getting, you know, finding a place yeah. to try something on. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's human, like this human movement is very, very flexible. For example, if, if it's a crowded thing, like seeing right scenario there's a lot of people and if we want to find a way go we go like all different ways, right? We move our body and we can manage to go, right? So we don't have such data. Right. How do you capture this like really subtle mm. movement so that you can navigate? Like this, the humans are amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and there's we don't have, have such data, large scale data, right? Yeah. And we don't have a model to really be able to capture such really natural like human mm. motion. That's a very interesting, exciting research topic. And to what degree does an emotional state of someone impact their motions? I, I, that's also a good question. Like probably we <laughs> uh, we want to study, right? Probably, probably there is an influence, right? There must be a correlation mm-hmm. between the emotion and the motion, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Probably there are also such data exist. Mm-hmm. So one need to capture such data and then maybe uh, one can study to learn some model. Uh, about that. It would be interesting because you could, I could also imagine then this could be something, if this becomes, if this becomes this normal, that you get a, a digital twin, a digital model of yourself, and you could then, if you go to the doctor for a checkup every few years, they can compare the movement, your actual movement, right? Just like you're getting your temperature checked, your blood sugar mm-hmm. checked, you could actually and that mm-hmm. could actually ex- you could examine the the flexibility mm-hmm. or the the, the gait. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. yeah. I I think yes. So I think the prop the probably the doctor now have some way to to record that and check that, but not probably not like at the visual level in the sense like there is a like a virtual avatar of this person how they move like three years ago and then maybe they can compare with now, but there is no such tools. But yeah. probably that would be uh, super interesting for doctors. <laughs> and so if I came into your lab, how long would it take for you to make a digital twin of me? Uh, uh, yeah, we are working on that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we are working on that. So, Not uh, yet. Uh, okay, go ahead. So the ultimate goal, right? The goal is really to have a Kinect here, right? Even you don't come to our lab, right? You have a, you can buy a Kinect. It's not <laughs> really expensive. So you have a Kinect there. You do a few poses, right, in front of Kinect, and then you send us the photos, and then we build a model for you. So uh-huh. that's the goal we have. So we, we, to me, there are three. So okay, there is a question whether it's re- super realistic or not. So of course it's not really like as realistic as a, a Hollywood movie style because we don't have 
we are aiming for like a monocular camera, right? Not really right. handheld cameras. So, but for 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 a reasonable realistic avatar, there are three steps. So we finished two steps, and there's still one step missing. So once we have that step, you can capture yourself with a few Kinect and send to us, and then <laughs> we will we will create an avatar for you. That sounds. Or you could set maybe you could you could create a service where you can send the camera and then I do it and it comes back. Yeah. You know, this is yeah, yeah, that yeah, way yeah. Re Reduce the consumption of cameras. You know, it's a, <laughs> it's a, or, or a iPhone. The next step is like the phone ah, like the, with no. a with a depth sensor. Yeah. Well, that we could do mm -hmm. with, a, with a depth sensor. That's interesting. Does the iPhone not have one? Uh, the latest one has a light lighter, like has a depth sensor. Mm -hmm. So I mean, for us, it's the depth sensor helps a lot for the depth and the good. So mm. we need that too. I didn't know that. So the new, the, the latest iPhones have lidar in them. Yes, yes, they build the lidar into phone. So the RGBD is the future, I think. <laughs> wow, that's the most draw. I didn't know that. I didn't. Do I have a lidar in my phone? It's not that's... a super accurate one, so it's uh, it's like quite sparse, but it still gives you reasonable depths. That's fantastic. That's yeah. Now I understand how they make the portrait mode work. I got it. Yeah, that's yeah. So that's cool. So, so you're talking, what what did I not ask you that I should have asked you? Uh, I I. I <laughs> like, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel we have discussed a lot. <laughs> we have no. It's been fascinating discussion. I'm just thinking as there's. If there's something that I, I I didn't ask you about that you thought I might be asking you, but I think we've covered pretty much everything from what you're doing, mm -hmm. what your big questions are, how this can impact into retail, and I think it's been for me really quite quite a journey. I'm mm -hmm. I, I'm looking for you know, but I have to I will confess to you when I came in I wasn't so sure I would ever want a digital twin. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's I, I totally understand it, right? Like, uh, I mean, it's it's not our like uh, goal, right? So to mm -hmm. to make everyone to twin, it's it's uh, our goal is to the technique, the technology behind it. Yeah. So the ability of making that is, and also the ability, uh, also important is the ability to understand humans from digital information, from digital images, right? Mm -hmm. And that goes beyond to make an avatar for ourselves. I think, be, I mean, to be able to understand humans from images and videos is, is, a, is an important thing for retail, right? Autonomous stores. It's also important for autonomous cars, right? Yeah. It's also important for autonomous robot <laughs> yep. and many other things. So, mm -hmm. so like making digital twins is something which I think useful, for example, for the future, like, like this virtual world, this virtual experience that's useful. But our, what we are doing is also have uh, lots of applications in many important uh, mm -hmm. different applications. Absolutely. Well, I thank you very, very much for your passion <laughs> and making this happen. And when that third step is ready, I will be the first one to come to your lab and get the digital twin, as long as you can put a bow tie on it, then I'm happy. And then um, just to remind everybody that who's on here and who'll be listening in the future that um, Xiu Tang also has a spotlight, which is at the AI Center website, and that the next s set of spotlight lab and dialogue that we will be doing will be on augmented reality, and that will be taking place in a few weeks time. So with that, what I would like to do is to say thank you very much, Yu Tang. Thank you. And thank you for all of you for pitching up. And I look forward to seeing you again on campus, physically. <laughs> all right, thank you very, very much. Ciao, ciao. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.